Testing. Camera speed. Testing. Sound production, take one. Action! Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era. Hear fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine, who quite literally lives just beneath the Hollywood sign, and actress-writer Nan McNamara. Now your hosts, Steve and Nan. Welcome back, everybody. This week's episode honors those people who served our our country. And we're going to be talking about movies that pay tribute to their sacrifice and all that they did for our country. And in particular, we found out both of our fathers <laughs> served in the Navy. That's right. And about the same time. And maybe they were on the same ship together. Wouldn't, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that have been something? That would be wild. Yeah. I love that. I wonder if they talked about old movies. <laughs> Except they wouldn't have been old back then. I know. They would have been the, new movies. <laughs> new runs. <laughs> so as we've done in other themed episodes, we each pick some films that we love. There are so many films oh, about so war. many to choose from. It was really hard to pare it down to three for me. Yeah, I have a feeling next year we'll be able to revisit this same topic and pick, <laughs> pick some others. But why don't you go first? My first film, which is in honor of the men and women who served in the military, is from 1941. It's a classic. Everyone knows it, but it's Sergeant York. Mm. It was directed by Howard Hawks. It was written by Harry Chanley and Abram Finkel and John John Houston and Howard Koch. It was based on the diary of the real life Alvin C. York. I did not know that. It was. It's a true story. He was one of the most decorated American soldiers of World War I. And the film is based on his diary, which was edited by Tom Skihill. It's a great film. It stars Gary Cooper, Walter Brennan, Joan Leslie, Margaret Witcherly, George Tobias. The way it starts out, it's a little bit before World War II breaks out for America. And mm-hmm. Alvin York. York, played by Gary Cooper. He's this dirt poor young farmer living in the rural mountains of Tennessee with his widowed mother, Margaret Witcherly, and his younger sister, played by June Lockhart, and his younger brother, played by Dickie Moore. Oh, wow. Two great actors. Yeah. Well, he's a little bit of a hellion. He loves to run around and drink and shoot up the town with his two best buddies. He's Gary Cooper. Of he's course Gary he does. Cooper. He's just <laughs> one of those guys. But his two best buddies are Ike, played by the great Ward Bond, oh. and Buck, played by Noah Beery Jr. Okay. Well, they spent their free time just getting drunk. They're sort of the bad boys of this sleepy little Tennessee town. Something happens to Alvin York, and it's an interesting scene. He and his mule, in the middle of a thunderstorm, get struck by lightning. He and his mule? It, they're, they're walking out in this thunderstorm. They get struck by lightning, and it becomes this epiphany for Alvin to clean up his act and you know, oh. not try to anger God. So he changes his ways, and he finds the Lord, and he gets back into church. And so he sort of dedicates himself to upholding the laws of the Bible and just being a better person. During this time, also, he's courting this pretty young thing named Gracie Williams, played by Joan Leslie. Mm. And so he wants to marry her, so he wants to buy her a plot of land that they can build a house on, so he's trying to save up money for that. Well, he's a really great sharpshooter, and he ends up getting the money for the land through a shooting contest. Okay. Which, tag that, because it's going to come to play when he gets into the military, of course. Around this time, his life is changed abruptly when World War I breaks out. He tries to avoid the draft. He basically files for an exemption due to his religious convictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he Mm -hmm. wants to sort of file as a conscientious objector. objector, Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, his request is denied. He's sent off to boot camp, and he really has to learn the meaning of what it means to be a soldier to protect the freedom of your country. Mm. And that's a really interesting part of the movie where he has to reconcile his deep belief in upholding the Ten Commandments and thou shalt not kill versus doing the right thing and fighting for your freedom as a country. And I think he finally ha- comes to a, a middle ground where he can understand and, and be okay with it. So he's sent to France right into the heart of battle. He knows what he has to do in spite of his beliefs. And he almost single handed captures like 130 German soldiers. He saves the day. He and this becomes, is all based on a true story. It's all based on a true story. And he becomes this phenomenal war hero wow. because of his actions you know, overseas. Mm. But it's a great story about character and conviction and, and that internal turmoil that mm. he has to deal with based on his beliefs and based on getting the job done and yeah. doing what you've got to do. That it's conflict just, within. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. It's just a beautiful, beautiful movie. It was a huge 
huge box office success. It became the highest grossing film of 1941. And it's been reported that the film's patriotic themes were so powerful that it actually helped recruit soldiers during I the war. I would imagine. Do you think that film today has that same power? I don't. I don't either. No, yeah. I don't. I don't think it has the collective influence that it used to have. Yeah, and I think partly it's because we are so spread out with so many ways to watch and so many things to watch that, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, the film ended up being nominated for 11 Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor for Walter Brennan, who plays the small town minister, and also Best Supporting Actress, Margaret Witcherly, who we had talked about earlier in White Heat, Yes, when she's such a a bad mother. A bad mama. And here she's a very good mother. (laughs) And she got an Oscar nomination. So So did anybody win? Actually, Gary Cooper won Best Actor. He won for that one. And it also won for Best Editing. Okay. Yeah, great movie. Oh, gosh, that's wonderful. Well, mine is just a year before your film. It's Foreign Correspondent. Ah, 1940, a thriller. It's written by Charles Bennett, Joan Harrison, James Hilton, and Robert Benchley. Robert Benchley and James Hilton are actually credited with writing dialogue. Robert Benchley is in the film, and he was allowed to write his own lines. Uh, <laughs> kind of, how often does that happen? Yeah, right? <laughs> Score by Alfred Newman, the amazing wow. Alfred Newman, and of course directed by Alfred Hitchcock. The film was nominated for six Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Supporting Actor for Albert Basserman, which we'll come back to, and Best Original Screenplay. I didn't realize this, but this film, Hitchcock's film, released the same year as Rebecca. Yeah. And both films were nominated for Best Picture, Rebecca, one. So he was having a good year. <laughs> the picture stars Joel McRae, Lorraine Day, who is known, I think, by some people as Nurse Mary Lamont on, yes, in all the Dr. Dr. Kildare, Kildare movies. movies. That's right. And our George Sanders, oh, who we, we love George. adore, plays a reporter. Herbert Marshall as well. And a slew of wonderful character actors. What in- a cast. I mean, yeah. even down to the smallest role, Edmund Gwynn plays a bad guy. Yep, not Santa Claus. I know. Chris Kringle from Miracle on 34th no. Street. He is, a, But he's a sweet bad guy. You, you <laughs> really course. can't quite believe he's going to do what he ends up doing. Yeah. Harry Davenport, who's oh, an editor of the American we newspaper. We love Harry Davenport. And Ian Wolfe as Herbert oh. Marshall's butler. Who oh, wow. Just, he's kind of the classic butler. So it's set in 1939 Europe. An American newspaper man named Johnny Jones, who's played by Joel McRae, he's sent to Europe to cover the possibility of war. And he is to be taken more seriously among the people that he's interacting with in Europe. His editor gives him a different name. So his name starts out as Johnny Jones, and it becomes Huntley Haverstock, <laughs> which I guess they were thinking we're in London, so maybe we need a new name. I'm not we sure. need a fancy, you know, hoity-toity name. Yes. So he ends up, as a reporter, meeting a gentleman by the name of Stephen Fisher, played by Herbert Marshall, who is the leader of England's Universal Peace Party. Mm, maybe not so much, but that's what he, we're told. And he also meets the Dutch diplomat Van Meer, who is played by Albert Basserman, and both are considered at the time the leading figures in this peace movement before war breaks out. So Van Meer is helping to write this treaty, this peace treaty, and it has secret clauses in it that are not known to anybody but a small group of people that are going to help for peace. But there are traders who are trying to figure out what those clauses say, and those traders are Germans, Uh right? Because this is World War II. So Joel McRae also meets Herbert Marshall's daughter, Carol Fisher, played by the lovely Lorraine Day. So lovely. She is is fabulous. Another underrated actress. I think so, too. Yeah. Joel McRae, it's really love at first sight. He falls in love with her, and she kind of falls in love w- with him pretty quickly, too. But it gets complicated when the diplomat I mentioned, Van Meer, we first think he's assassinated, then we realize he's kidnapped, and the German spies try to torture slash force him into revealing the secrets of the peace treaty. So the rest of the film is how they find him and how they resolve this horrible situation. And there are people I won't give away that are part of this plot that are not who they appear to be. <laughs> Some say that Hitchcock wanted Gary Cooper in the role that Joel McRae ends up playing. 
Some say Clark Gable. Some say Cary Grant. Nothing against Joel McRae, <laughs> but he's a he's a little rougher around the edges than I would like for the role. Yeah. I think he was called the poor man's. Yeah, he was the poor man's Gary K- Cooper. Gary or, Cooper. Yeah, yeah poor they man's did kind of call Cooper. him that. Um, and he did sort of have that ah shut kind he of. He has a yeah. little bit of that, yeah. which you want to see in a comedy. And this yes. is there are some funny elements of it because Hitchcock always tries to you know mine that. But I'm splitting hairs because the film really is quite wonderful. And speaking of the role of Carol Fisher, played by Lorraine Day, Hitchcock wanted Stanwyck or Joan Fontaine. And so he ended up with the lovely Lorraine Day, who I thought was just Yeah, she pitch was perfect. great in that movie. I also learned something really interesting that Basserman, who plays Van Meer, he did not know a word of English. Oh, really? And he learned all of his lines phonetically. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. He That's crazy. He received the Academy Award nomination. I, yeah. Hey, and got him an Oscar nomination. And, yeah. <laughs> this film has some classic Hitchcock scenes. If you didn't know Hitchcock directed it, you would watch it and go, oh my gosh, this looks like a Hitchcock film. Yeah. There's a wonderful scene where it's raining and the person who has assassinated someone is running through this overhead shot with all these open umbrellas and it's wow. spectacular. There's also a scene with a windmill, a climactic chase, and there's a plane crash at the end. There's <laughs> there's a lot happening. It's part thriller, it's part romance with the backdrop of the start of World War II. It certainly has a propaganda aspect to it. There was a final scene that was added after filming ended with Star Spangled Banner playing oh. over the final credits. <laughs> right. But it is one of those films that if you haven't seen, check it out. It really is quite a thriller. It is. It's such a great... I remember when I saw it for the first time, like, you have to stay on your toes to keep up with the plot. You do. It's so complex. It's complicated. And yeah. And, but it's and, so good. The and, payoff is delicious. Yeah. If you have a fear of heights, too, it's a yeah. little... Oh, it's a little screepy. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's a good one. That's good. a good one. All right. Well, what you got? So my next film is a little bit different because... This one is told from the point of view of the women of war. Oh. Uh, which is an interesting POV you yes. know, to have. And the movie is So Proudly We Hail mm. from 1943. It was directed by Mark Sandrich. The writer is Alan Scott. And it's based on a book by Lieutenant Colonel Juanita Hips. Oh. So it's, it's based on this one nurse's experiences. I love that you have two that are that are based on true stories. Yeah, which yeah, is kind of, stories. kind of interesting. Yeah. And this one's just interesting, but you really get to see the nurse's point of view from yeah. a woman's point of view. This movie starred Claudette Colbert, mm. Paulette Goddard, Veronica Lake, George Reeves, Sonny Tufts, Barbara Britton, Cora Witherspoons, the great Mary Treen, who I love so much, and Walter Abel. But this movie, it begins with a group of Red Cross Army nurses arriving in Australia on a boat. They have been some of the few people who were evacuated when the Japanese captured their base during the Battle of Bataan, Mm -hmm. which we all know was one of the most brutal battles of all of World War II. The head nurse, her name is Janet Davidson. They affectionately call her Davy. She's the one played by Claudette Colbert. Okay. When they arrive in Australia, she is in a coma. And so through a series of flashbacks, we learn what happened to these nurses and oh. why Davy is in a coma. Wow. So it's, it's a totally flashback story, which is really cool. And so when the flashback starts, they're in California as uh, the nurses are preparing to ship off to the Philippines. We first meet nurse Joan O'Doul, played by Paulette Goddard, and nurse Davy. Davidson, as I mentioned, Mm -hmm. played by Claudette Colbert. They quickly bond when Davy helps Joan keep her two fiancés apart. (laughs) <laughs> when they both come to the shipyard to wave goodbye to her. I love that she had two fiancés. Apparently, Joan just couldn't say no. <laughs> she couldn't say no. <laughs> and she has two fiancés, and of course, Claudette Colbert helps her keep them apart. It's it's this funny kind of scene. Another one of the nurses is named Rosemary Larson, and she's played by the wonderful Barbara Britton. Mm. And she's this very naive, inexperienced girl, but she has a really deep passion for the profession. So en route to the Philippines, one of the ships in their convoy is sunk by enemy fire. So they end up taking on the survivors of the sunk ship. Okay. And one of the survivors who climbs on board their ship is nurse Olivia Darcy, played by Veronica Lake. Oh. And this is such an unusual role for Veronica Lake. I was going to say, that does not sound like a Veronica Lake role. It's not. And in fact, I think it's maybe Veronica Lake's finest film performance Mm. ever. Mm -hmm. Um, She's so good because she plays this very cold, aloof, and unfair 
friendly nurse who wants nothing to do with Davy or Joan or hmm. any of the other nurses. Right. She's cold. She's closed off. She's bitter. Nobody can penetrate this ice queen. Yeah. So, so clearly on, there's something going on. There's, yeah. yeah. She's, got a, she's got a backstory. She's got a story. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, on the boat, when they're going to the Philippines, Davy meets a young medic named John Summers, played by Superman, George Reeves. Okay. Nice. <laughs> she immediately hates him. But then, of course, she later loves him, yeah, right, as we right. tend to do in these movies. Right. And also, on the other hand, Joan meets a Marine called Kansas, played by Sonny Tufts, who, interestingly enough, was also referred to as a poor man's Gary Cooper. Okay. He mm-hmm. was another one that, that got that title. Yeah. Uh, and he's a sort of Midwest, former football star, kind of golly gee whiz kind of guy. And and then also Rosemary begins working with this Dr. Jose Bardia, played by Ted Hesch. And she really comes into her own when she starts working with this doctor. And she gets more confidence as a nurse. And she falls in love with him. So <laughs> even though war is raging around and bobs are blowing off, the women find love interests. Yes, yes. <laughs> It was a 1940s movie. So. Right. Um, well, finally, through time and some persistence, Davy is able to break through to Olivia. She finds out her backstory. And what happened was Olivia was supposed to be married, and her fiancé was killed at Pearl Harbor. Oh, so that's why she's, that's why she's so, so closed off. bitter and mad at the world. So eventually, they get to their base camp in the Philippines. There, Olivia volunteers to nurse the wounded Japanese prisoners. But she has very nefarious revenge infused intentions. Oh, wow. she plans this to is complicated. she wants to get revenge for the death of her fiance. So she's going to be the nurse on the ward and she's going to kill these prisoners. But when the moment came, you know, when the truth comes, she can't do it. You know, okay. she realizes she can't kill another soul. So and it, it's what helps kind of break her down and, and soften okay. her up a little bit. It's yeah. a really kind of a beautiful scene, which is really interesting. Then after this, shortly afterwards, their hospital gets bombed and they have to set up a very makeshift hospital in the jungle, which is just treacherous and they don't have supplies and there's bombs all around them. It's really this perilous situation. Mm. And I think the beauty of this film is that it offers this very raw, honest look at World War II Mm -hmm. through the eyes of these nurses who Mm -hmm. are right on the front line of it. You know, it's also a film about the fortitude and the bravery, the sacrifice that these nurses make and just how they navigate this hellish landscape of war. And it's about their friendships. Yeah. TCM writer Jeremy Arnold, who was a friend of us here at From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. Yes. He once wrote about So Proudly We Hailed. He said it was the perfect combination of the combat film and the woman's picture. You have the intense battle scenes with both visual and sound effects juxtaposed with a wedding, a honeymoon in a foxhole, no less, a dance, <laughs> childbirth, mother-son scenes, and even a negligee, which becomes a very comical part of the plot. The acting is superb. It was nominated for four Oscars, including for writing, cinematography, special effects, and Best Supporting Actress for Paulette Goddard, Oh, which to me is so surprising because if I were to give any of those actresses a Best Supporting Actress nomination, it would have been Veronica Lake. Yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of a shame because it really was Veronica Lake's finest mm. performance and it's definitely worth checking out. I cannot wait to watch that. I haven't seen it and I'm adding it to my list. Oh, you'll love it. Before we move on to more films, let's dive into this week's Hollywood Pop Quiz. So the Pop Quiz question of the day, keeping in tune with our war movie theme, according to Box Office Mojo, what is the highest growth war film of all time. Wow. And it might take us out of the classic zone, folks. Yes, I'm thinking it will. It it, it was actually a little surprising to me. Okay. We'll be right back with the answer and more films with our Memorial Day-themed episode after this. Steve and Ann will be right back, but first another stop on the Hollywood tour. In the film industry, the years from 1927 to 1934 were known as pre-code Hollywood. Why? Well, this brief period marked the time between the introduction of sound in films and the strict enforcement of the motion picture production codes, also known as the Hayes Code. Now, the Hayes Code was a result of Hollywood's increasingly scandalous image throughout the 1920s, both on and off the screen. So to clean things up, the Hayes Code stated that no film should, quote, lower the moral standards of those who see it, and included a long list of rules for filmmakers. Among the prohibitions were, get this, nudity, unnecessary use of liquor, ridicule of religion, 
lustful kissing and scenes of passion. You see all those things that appeared in dozens of films during the bold and bawdy pre-code years. See how noble Hollywood was back then? And now back to Steve and Nan from Beneath the Hollywood Sign. Welcome back, everyone. But before we dive a little deeper into movies that honor our men and women who've served, we want to say thank you to our listener of the week. And our listener of the week, there's actually two this time. It's Terry and Derek Brown. Thank you guys so much. I know you guys have been supporting us and sharing our post, and and we really appreciate everything you guys do for us. Thank you, guys. Next up, 12 O'Clock High. Ooh, such a good movie. 1949. Such a good movie. Remember the series? I never watched it as a kid, but there was a series, apparently. I never saw it. Written by Cy Bartlett and Burnley Jr., based on their book, actually. And just to give a little background on what 12 O'Clock High means, it's an example of a pilot's enemy position call. So if during World War II or any time, pilots would call out the positions of enemy airplanes by referring to where they are on a clock. And 12 o'clock was in front and six is behind. So when you hear somebody say, check your six, it means check behind (laughs) you. I love that kind of stuff. I love that stuff too. This film is directed by Henry King. It stars Gregory Peck, Henry King and Gregory Peck would go on to work together in five more films. Oh, wow. Another score by the great Alfred Newman, but interestingly, only for the first few minutes. There is no scoring during the majority of the film. It's just the sounds of the war, sounds of the plane, sounds of bombing. Oh, kind wow. Of, how powerful of, that must have been. Yeah, and very unusual for that time. Yes. As I mentioned, it stars Gregory Peck, who was nominated for an Academy Award for his performance, Hugh Marlowe, Gary Merrill. A reunion from All About Eve. It's a reunion. <laughs> Millard Mitchell singing, singing in the, the rain. rain. Yes. And the great Dean Jagger, who won an Academy Award for his performance and who would go on in five years to play the retired general in White Christmas. And his performance always leaves me a mess oh, in need of lots of cleaning. He's so good. He's so good. It also received an Academy Award nomination for Best Picture and Sound. And just to mention, it is available free on YouTube right now. Oh, nice. Um, and I think it's coming up also on TCM. Many of the characters in the film are based on real people, the experiences of a former bomb group commander. And this film was actually used for decades to train Air Force cadets. Oh, really? I didn't know that. So it starts in London in 1949. You've had a couple of films that have flashbacks. Yes. (laughs) This uses flashback to a beautiful effect. American attorney and former U.S. Army Air Force officer Harvey Stovall, played by Dean Jagger, is vacationing in Great Britain, and he spots a Toby jug at an antique store. I had to look up what a Toby jug was. And those are those big ceramic pitchers, or they can be cups, that are of the face modeled in the form of a popular character or historical figure. So if you're in an antique store, now you know what that's called. It's a Toby (laughs) joke. He spots this in the window and he immediately recognizes it as something from his past in the war. And it turns out it was a jug that was in the officer's bar. And whenever the jug was facing forward, they could drink. And when it was turned back, (laughs) no alcohol allowed. So he takes the jug and he gets on his bike and he drives out to a place called Archbury. It's an old Royal Air Force Station, where the United States was also stationed, and the 918th Bomb Group was there during World War II. And you now see it in 1949, completely weeds grown over, the structures are still there, but it's completely abandoned, and you start to see him hear the sounds of the war, and it's a beautiful transition. Oh, wow. And he and we are brought back to 1942, and the main plot of the film begins. The group of flyers at this particular base has a reputation of being a bad luck group. They're headed by Gary Merrill as Colonel Keith Davenport. Everybody on this base is overworked, overtired, and the film begins with them having experienced a number of huge losses rather graphically described, which I was a little surprised by the by the time period that they would actually talk about it in that way. But it really makes the war a visceral, real mm-hmm. event. It does not glorify anything. This group of flyers is being asked by their superiors to bomb at a lower altitude and during the day mm. for accuracy. Wow. They don't want to have to keep going back. They're yeah. missing. And Colonel Davenport is having none of it. He <laughs> goes to Frank Savage, who is the general being played by Gregory Peck, Gary Merrill's character character has what they call over-identified with his boys. So he has no perspective. He's so empathic and so, you know, cares and loves for them that he's missing what the superiors need him to 
do. So he's relieved of his duty. And Peck is now taken over. Major General, played by Millard Mitchell, is afraid that Gary Merrill is going to crack. So Gregory Peck to the rescue, and he purposely becomes a different guy. He is harsh with his men. He is disciplining them. The men hate him. You can see Gregory Peck (laughs) transform into this other character. How can you hate Gregory Peck? I know. (laughs) I know. How can you? And but it's really masterfully done. And it's a role that I was I was really surprised because he just is this straight ramrod general that will not allow these boys to really succumb to this bad luck mentality. In fact, one of the things he says at the top when he first takes over is, "Consider yourselves already dead. After that, it won't be so tough." Which is, you know, wow. pretty harsh. That's right? intense. <laughs> so all of these pilots, they hate him, and they all apply for a transfer. And this is where it gets a little interesting. Major Stovall, the Dean Jagger character, sees what Gregory Peck's character is doing and helps to delay these applications so that he has time to help them understand what he is trying to get them to do. Yeah. They do some retraining, and they are very successful. And Gregory Peck, not one to sit back in his office, he jumps in the plane with them. There are some complications with his character that I won't reveal because the war does take a toll on him as well. But essentially, this film really deals with the psychological effect of war on its soldiers. And it was one of the first Hollywood films to do that. Another fascinating part of this film, the air battles that are shown in this film are actually cut together from authentic World War II footage. Oh, wow. And at the very top of the film, there is a B-17 bomber that crashes onto the airstrip. It was not a special effect. Of course, they didn't have special effects back then. Stunt pilot Paul Mance was paid quite a tidy sum back then to crash land the bomber, and he walks away from the wreck. Until the 1970s, the amount that he was paid, which was, according to my research, $4,500, that was the largest amount paid to a stuntman for a single stunt. Oh, really? Yeah, That's which is so fascinating. In 2022, dollar amount would be $53,600 for oh. doing that stunt. Here's 50 grand. You might die. You might die. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, boy. <laughs> Now, it's a powerful film, as I mentioned. Yes. Peck's performance is quite remarkable. And, and it, very unusual for Gregory Peck. Very yeah. unusual. It really shows the breadth of what yes. he is able to do. And it really highlights the sacrifices that so many people made during World War II. My only gripe about the movie is that there's only three lines of female dialogue. <laughs> In the whole movie. In the whole movie. Wow. Spoken by a hospital nurse. But you know what? That's okay. Because it really picks this one particular specific group of men. And um, God bless them. God bless them. Indeed. All right. What you got? All right. You know, for my last film, is it the best war film ever made? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But it's fun. It's funny. It has such a charm to it. It's sort of nice for the palate. You know, when you're talking about all these other dark, heavy movies, this this is a nice one to kind of talk about. And it's Operation Petticoat. Oh, I love this film. From 1959. We all know it. We all love it. It's directed by Blake Edwards. I think this was his fourth oh, feature film that, that he directed. It was written by Stanley Shapiro and Maurice Richland. And it's based on a story by Paul King and Joseph Stone. It stars Cary Grant and Tony Curtis, Dina Merrill, Joan O'Brien, and one of my favorite character actors ever, Arthur O'Connell, hmm. who was in everything. Yes, yes. <laughs> It was nominated for one Oscar for Best Writing. Okay. Well, like So Proudly We Hail and 12 O'Clock High, Operation Petticoat is also told through flashback. Okay. So we have a theme going yes, here. Yes, we do. We didn't even know it. <laughs> yes. The movie starts in current day for them, 1959, when U.S. Navy Rear Admiral Matt Sherman, played by Cary Grant, boards the obsolete diesel submarine, the USS Sea Tiger, prior to her departure for the scrapyard. Oh. The importance of him being there there was that Sherman was the Sea Tiger's very first commanding officer, and he wanted to go and see the old sub before it goes off of to the course. boneyard. Because it's sort of like, you know how our cars in LA yeah, become like it, our, they're, they're like people? It was an emotional connection. <laughs> yes. So it begins with Rear Admiral Sherman entering the 
submarine and finding his old wartime personal logbooks, mm. which were like his diaries that sure. he wrote about the day-to-day activities of what happened on this submarine. Well, this is where the flashbacks began, because as he reads from the logbook, we are taken back and we see the story of what happened with the Sea Tiger. It all starts out in December of 1941, and the Sea Tiger is parked at a, a shipyard. It's attacked by a Japanese air raid. Mm. It's hit and nearly sunk by the dock. Okay. Well, everyone's given up on it, but Lieutenant Commander Sherman at the time, he refuses to give up on the Sea Tiger. He tells everybody there at the base that he can fix it, that they can repair it. Well, meanwhile, all of his men, except for a skeleton crew, get shipped off to other ships and other submarines. So he's kind of left with this sort of hodgepodge, ragtag, skeletal crew to try to fix the Sea Tiger to get back into the war, because that's all he wants to do. He's this very straight and narrow, by-the-book kind of guy, and he just wants to get back in there and fight for his country. Well, believing that there's really no chance of repairing the submarine, the officer in charge at the base says, all right, you, you have a couple of weeks. If you can get the submarine running, you can go. He gets assigned this Lieutenant Nick Holden, played by Tony Curtis. He's this admiral's aide, and he's never really had much experience. He's never had any real training. Mm-hmm. He's sort of this ne'er-do-well, kind of devil-may-care attitude with this very unorthodox way of doing things. He's kind of a hustler, uh, <laughs> you know, which is just complete opposite of Cary Grant's character. So, of course, they become these sort of comedic adversaries. Yes. Which is really fun. fun. You know, Sherman wants it done the right way. Right. Holden finds other more creative ways to get what they need. Right. So he is assigned being the supply officer for the ship. So he's able to go and just scavenge through the base and he steals everything that's not nailed down (laughs) that can help get the Sea Tiger back up and running. Okay. So they get going. They're on their way. He makes it. They're out to sea. They make another pit stop at another port and um, while they're there, and this is where things get really complicated, they end up taking on some unexpected passengers. In the form of five attractive army nurses. <laughs> I was going to say, they have to be picking up some some yes. lovely ladies. Well, these nurses were stranded in the Philippines, and they have no way to get out of there. So reluctantly, Lieutenant Commander Sherman says, come on, ladies, we'll go. What could possibly go wrong with a submarine full of... Of women. Of five beautiful women <laughs> and 20 sailors. I'm thinking, I'm thinking a towel is involved at some point. <laughs> well, immediately, Nick Holden, Tony Curtis's character, is drawn to nurse Barbara Duran, played by Dina Merrill. One of the other nurses, Lieutenant Dolores Crandall, played really very hilariously by Joan O'Brien. She's this klutzy but well-meaning nurse who becomes a thorn in the side of Lieutenant Commander Sherman. I mean, she screws up everything. It's very funny. And also, the chief mechanic, Sam Testing, played by Arthur O'Connell, he is threatened when the commander of the nurses, Major Edna Hayward, played by Virginia Gregg, proves to be just as mechanically inclined as he is, mm-hmm. causing friction in the engine room. Okay. So it's all complicated. I love complicated. that she's just as mechanically inclined. Yeah, she is. She's a, she's a <laughs> badass on that submarine, and he's he's very threatened yeah, as he goes. Yeah, of course. Uh, so these nurses wreak havoc on this tight-quartered submarine. There's all this sexual innuendo and fun, and the whole thing is really fun because what also happens is one of Holden's scavenger missions, He they want to repaint the submarine. Uh-huh. He ends up getting all this base paint, but he can only get red and white. But not enough of either to cover it. So they mix it together. And it becomes. And it becomes the brightest pink you've ever seen. And so they paint the submarine pink. I love it. Pink. But that's just the undercoat. They've got gray. They're going to eventually okay. paint over it. But unfortunately, the Japanese attack again. They have to leave in a hurry. So they have left as this very bright pink submarine with five nurses on board wreaking havoc. That's sort of the story of of how these men and women survive the war, go through all of these missions, survive each other. There's love. Love is in the air. There's love in the air. There's fights. There's breakups. There's all these wonderful things. It kind of has the the 1959 feel to it. You know, there's so many movies in that Like Doris Day could have been involved. Exactly. She should have been in it. She should have been in it. Yeah, Yeah. well, the fun of this movie is the supporting cast. It is chock full of some of our favorite TV stars mm-hmm. of the 70s and 80s. Sure. Marion Ross oh, from wow. Happy Days is I, one of the nurses. Yes. Uh, Dick Sargent from Bewitched oh. is one of the officers on board. And Gavin McLeod, who would later be the captain of the Love Boat, yes. is uh, one of the officers also on the submarine. I love it. All right, last film, Shenandoah. 
1965. Uh, one of my favorites. Written by James Lee Barrett, directed by Andrew V. McLaglen. It's one of the films that early on when we first started the pod, I always think of because when I was a kid, on a Saturday afternoon, st sitting on the floor by myself, watching this movie on television, I was bawling like a baby. <laughs> so it's set in 1864. Widower Charlie Anderson, played by the incomparable Jimmy Stewart, is a prosperous Virginia farmer. And he's quoted in the film as saying, whose farm was built without the sweat of one slave. Now, he is a pacifist. He says he doesn't have anything to do with the war because of that. He has a number of children who run the farm with him. When the Civil War springs up around him and his family, he ignores it. He discourages his sons from enlisting. But the youngest boy that is his son, who actually his wife was killed in childbirth after having had him, he's played by Philip Alford. And I remember oh. as a young girl watching him in this movie, I had such a crush on him. <laughs> oh my goodness. He's out running around exploring with his African-American friend, Gabriel, and he finds a Confederate cap of a soldier that's in the river running by him. He grabs it and puts it on as any kid who was nine or 10 or 11 would do. Big mistake. <laughs> well, that's a big mistake. He is then mistaken for a Confederate soldier, and he is taken prisoner. Gabriel runs off and tells the family about this. And so the whole rest of the movie becomes how to get him back. So this pacifist family sort of gets pulled into the war, they like do. it or not. They yeah. do. I mean, clearly the soldiers who see this young kid don't believe that he's not a soldier because he's carrying a rifle because that's what you did back in 1864. So they're on a mission yeah. now to find him and get him back. His son, played by Patrick Wayne, and his daughter-in-law, played by Catherine Ross, are killed and other things are done to them by the Confederate Army drifters that come onto the property. By the way, it's the film debut of Catherine Ross. Yes, that's right. And Rosemary Forsyth that's right. as well. Yes. Now, the film also stars Doug McClure, who in an interesting kind of plot twist, he plays a Confederate soldier who is courting and ultimately ends up marrying Rosemary Forsyth. Other actors in the film are Glenn Corbett, as I mentioned, Philip Alford, and Charles Robinson, who I actually knew and did one of his plays when I first started out oh, here. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And some wonderful character faves in this time period. Denver Pyle yes. is in it, George Kennedy, and of course, Harry Carey Jr. Are, they're also featured. Jimmy Stewart in the film, of course, he's really the thrust of the story. His character talks in voiceover to his wife at the grave as they struggle through this period of time. And he says at the gravesite, this war is like all wars, I suppose. The undertakers are winning it. The politicians talk a lot about the glory of it, and the old men will talk about the need of it, but the soldiers, they just want to go home. I don't want to give away the final scene or what ends up happening because that's what made me ball like a baby. Oh, and I, I, don't, <laughs> I want anybody who hasn't seen it to ball like a baby, too. Yeah, don't, don't spoil that. Let them yeah. enjoy every mournful, tearful exactly. <laughs> moment. And what's, what's funny, too, is I always think of that theme, Shenandoah, running throughout the film. It's actually not in no. the film all that much. Yeah. It's, I think, just twice. But that beautiful song, it, it just really pierces your heart. Yeah. So it's a civil war western with an anti-war message it's also about family it's also about romance it's sentimental yes. and you know i love me some sugar <laughs> but it's also i think a really really powerful film about about that time period and just about the ravages of war. Absolutely. I, I love this film, and I think you just summed it up so beautifully. It's it's about all of these things, but ultimately, it's about the horrors of war. Yes, yeah. yes. And if I'm not mistaken, I think this was Philip Alford's follow-up to, to Kill a Mockingbird. I think this was his follow-up film after yeah, he played Jim be. in To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes. And he's so good in he's both. He's so good. And I just defy you not to cry at the final scene. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> All right, how about giving us the answer, and I've been just ruminating about it, <laughs> to our Hollywood pop quiz. Yeah, this is the tough one. At least I think it's tough. Yeah, okay, so um, the question was... According to Movie Mojo, what is the highest grossing war film of all time? It's from 2014, American Sniper with Bradley Cooper. Oh, wow. $547 million. 
gross. Wow. That is the highest ranking war film. I do remember that film. And I, I would not have picked that one. Yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> have either. Well, we would really appreciate it if you would take a minute to give us a five-star review anywhere you listen to our pod. We also would love it if you would follow us on social media. Our handle is at From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and you can watch the podcast on YouTube. And we love your emails. Keep them coming. Yes. Please email us at info at from beneath the Hollywood sign dot com. That's this week's view. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. You've been listening to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign with Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara, the podcast that celebrates amazing stories of Tinseltown from its golden era. Join us next week for another episode and learn something else about Hollywood you probably never knew. Take a moment and give us a five-star rating and a positive review. And tell your friends about us, too. It'll help grow the podcast. Visit Steve's website at FromBeneathTheHollywoodSign.com. The executive producers are Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara. Executive producer and post-production supervisor, Lindsay Schneble. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like The Box of Oddities and The Shallow End with Schneble and Toth. Copyright 2024, all rights reserved. That's a wrap. Many of the characters... I'm sorry, do you mention at all that it was shot during real missions? I will. You do. Okay. Yes. Yes. I that was Do you want to get your own podcast? <laughs> about old time I, have uh, I have mine, darling. <laughs>